third time's a charm. It actually worked this time. That's good. All right. It's good to see everybody this morning. If you want to open your Bibles to the book of Colossians, we're going to continue our study uh, through that letter that Paul uh, wrote to the church in Colossae and uh, spend some time just really meditating on these words and being encouraged uh, by Paul's words to, to that congregation there. So last week, we spent some time through chapter 1. We're going to continue in chapter 1 and into chapter 2 this morning. Uh, but Paul starts off by really expressing his gratitude, uh, his excitement, he and the other apostles, how excited they were um, that the, uh, the brethren there responded or the people responded to the gospel and, and how this, um, this little congregation, as we probably assume it's fairly small, little house church, uh, had its beginnings and how excited and encouraging that was. In fact, Paul says um, in regards to that, that he's heard about their faith in Christ Jesus and love which they have for all the saints. And he is, he is thankful to God for, for them and for their response. He is thankful to God that there are people in this community who have put their faith in Jesus. And then Paul writes this beautiful hymn. And so I, I really want to just I want to just read it again. Uh, it's such a beautiful hymn, and um, I imagine that the brethren in Colossae read it many times. They they probably memorized it and probably um, sang this uh, this hymn or at least uh, recited it. But I, I think it's a powerful statement of who Jesus is. So let's go ahead and read that again. This is Colossians 1:15 through 20, and it said, "He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation." For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. In him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through Jesus, I say whether things on earth or things in heaven. Now, obviously, it's a, it's a very beautiful hymn. It's very um, insightful. It's something that uh, we, we really need to meditate on and think about and, and uh, come to a fuller understanding of the person of Jesus. But what, what Paul's going to do next, he's going to take the principles of that hymn. He's going to basically say, okay, here, this is Jesus. <laughs> this is who he is. This, this is. this is God in the flesh. This is God who has come, who has died who has shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins, has been resurrected, raised to ascend to the right hand of the Heavenly Father. This is who he is. And now this is what you need to do in light of that reality, in light of that truth, and in, in light of that fact about who Jesus is. And so let's, let's go ahead and, and continue on with Paul's words as he makes application of this beautiful hymn. He says in verse 21, and he says, And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. And so he, he does this often. Paul does this a lot, and it's a reminder. Uh, Paul wants them to remember who they were and who they are. Because he wants them to recognize that when, when they were without Jesus, that they had nothing. Yes, they had a life, and yes, they had, they had work, and they had things, but, but those things were all in darkness. They, they were not in the light. They, they, were, they were living life, but they weren't truly living life. And so it, Paul reminds them of who they were in telling them that, you know, before Jesus, before God came to you and brought you this message of peace, brought you 
this gospel through his ministers that you were engaged in deeds. That those are the things that you practiced. They probably didn't know that. I mean, they probably didn't have an idea of what was good and what was bad. They didn't have a standard other than the standard that had been given to them by the culture in which they lived in. In other words, everybody else was doing it, so they were doing it too, and they didn't see a problem with it. Uh, but now that they have been educated, now that they have been taught, now that they have heard the gospel of Jesus and understood a new way of living, they recognize that that life that they once lived was not the life that God wanted them to live. And so in faith, they are now living a new life. But Paul certainly wants to remind them, hey, this is who you were, and this is who you are. This is who you were when you were trapped in the, the, um, the domain of darkness. But now you have been transferred to the kingdom of light. And so life is now different than it used to be. Life is now different than it once was. You are no longer practicing the deeds of evil. You're, you're no longer enemies of God. But you have been, through Jesus, reconciled to God. You have, you have been brought to a place where there's peace between you and God, but it's not, not of you. You have to remember that. You, you know, when you, when you lived your life, when, when you did things your way, your deeds were evil. You are enemies of God. But now, because of and through Jesus, you have peace by the blood of his cross. You, you've been reconciled to God. And that relationship is now highlighted in their life. God became flesh in the person of Jesus. The, the immortal God experienced death so that, so that we, so that they, so that we can be reconciled to God. So that we can have peace. So that we can have a relationship with God. Which, by the way, was not possible. It was not possible for us to have that relationship with God without the person of Jesus. And that's why these things are so incredibly important. That's why passages that we have just read about Jesus are so incredibly important because we have to remember and recognize that the relationship that we enjoy in the present was not possible. It was not possible without God doing something, <laughs> without God allowing us and inviting us. And in our case, it's through the person of Jesus that we can have that kind of relationship with God. And when I say it's possible, it's not possible because the sin in which we have committed has created this, this great separation between us and God. And, and there's nothing we could, could do about that sin. That sin was just there. It, it was the guilt in which we held. And, and even if we tried... Our heart is to undo what we've done. We could never undo what we've done. Even if we attempted to do things to try to appease God and say, Lord, I know I've sinned, but for the rest of my life I will do good, it would be to nothing. We could never do enough good to offset the sin in which we've committed. And there's no excuse for that. There's no way we could say, well, Lord, I didn't know that was a sin back when I sinned. Can't I get a free pass? You know, won't you just let that one go? Um, now that I'm in the know, I won't sin anymore. Of course, we know that's not entirely true. But the reality is there was a necessity. In order for us to be reconciled to God, there needed to be a penalty paid for the sin. And the cross, the cross fulfilled that in more ways than we can probably comprehend. The blood of Jesus allows us to have the forgiveness of sins, which allows us to have peace with God, which was not possible without Jesus. In reality, you know what we call that? We call that God's grace. That's grace. And I know that word gets thrown around a lot in many different contexts and many different ways, but, but in reality, that's God's That's the charity of God. That God has done something for us, as Paul would say, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God has done something for us, and it was the cross. It was the offering of his son. It was the sacrificing of Jesus. 
And you know what? He, he didn't ask for our advice. You know, he didn't consult us first and say, hey, you know, I'm thinking about doing this. What, what do you think that's a good idea? You know, he didn't need our help. It was a plan that he purposed and planned and brought about because he's a gracious and merciful God, because he is a loving God, because he's a compassionate God, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That is, in essence, the foundation, the principle of grace. And which we live in, in the present. It is the gospel. Look at verse 23. He says this. He says, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, was made a minister. If, if indeed you continue in the faith. You know, I find that people, they, they love the idea of Jesus. I mean, who doesn't, right? I mean, we love the idea of Jesus. We love the concept and the idea of grace. We, we love that charity. We love the fact that, that it has been given, and, and we love that story. We love that message. We love the fact that we can have peace and forgiveness from our sins. But a lot of times, people are not so keen on the word if you know that word over there doesn't doesn't really doesn't really strike people as the idea of of gospel and Jesus and grace but then you put, throw that word if in there then people get really uncomfortable well Paul is is liberal with his your word if right because he wants him to know that yes this is who you were this is who you are now this is how you continue and that if is incredibly important to the message. Because without the if, then we fall into the trap. The trap of, of losing what we have. We fall into the trap of being deceived into following some other message. We, we fall into the trap of saying, well, you know, I've been saved by grace and therefore there's nothing more for me to do. I will continue in faith, continue in grace... And, and I, I have no concerns because nothing will ever happen. I will never do anything. Nobody else will do anything. You know, I'm just, it's going to be okay. And yes, that's nice. And, and it's nice to hear. But Paul is saying this. He's saying, if, if indeed you continue in the faith. So what is Paul saying? He's saying, well, there's a possibility that some of y'all may not continue in the faith. That's what he's saying. And, and just the, the fact, just the reality of that should really cause us to stop and say, okay, um, I, I, there's a warning here, <laughs> you know, red flag. You know, I need to be careful. I have a responsibility. I have things I need to do. You know, it, it's kind of like I, I kind of compare it to um, working on electricity. Don't, I don't advise any of y'all, if you don't know what you're doing, don't go home and, and try to do your own wiring. Um, you know, I, I, I like to try to do a lot of things on my own. Um, but, um, but you know, there's something that you have to know. You know, you can take a bun bundle of wires, you can twist them together, you can do whatever you want with them. If they're not plugged into anything, there, there's no concern, right? And you may have an incredible amount of confidence to go in there and do all kinds of work, all kinds of wiring. You put wires together, you don't even think twice about it. It doesn't concern you one bit until that one day that you realize, you know, some of these wires have power going through them. And they're dangerous. And you put these two wires together, it's going to really shock you, you know. I mean, there's going to be a big surprise, you know. And so before that, you're just ignorant to it. You're just thinking, yeah, it's no concern, there's no worry, I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. But after that, you realize, oh, there's a concern here. I need to be more careful. I need to be more cautious, I need to be more aware of what I'm doing. I need, to, I need to understand the dangers. And that's what Paul is doing. He's not trying to discourage anybody. He's trying to encourage us. He's trying to say, look, this is what God has done through Jesus. And it's beautiful. And it's wonderful. And it's beyond our comprehension. And you have received it with gratitude. And you're living it out. Now, now you need to understand there's an if. There's a concern. There's a danger that we need to be aware of. 
if you are steadfast, if you continue. If you remember what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, he said, for by grace you have been saved through faith. He said, it's not of yourself, it is a gift of God. See, the grace that God has bestowed upon the people of the world, it has, it has given it for all of us. He has made salvation available for all of us through the person of Jesus. And, and that's what God has done. Right? And, and Paul wants us to realize it is not of us. We, we didn't do anything. I, I wasn't good enough to earn it. I wasn't good enough to deserve it. I had nothing to do with that. That was God. And it was all God. He's the one who has the power and the ability to do that. Right? But, but then again, he also wants us to recognize that there is a responsibility to hearing that kind of news. As incredible as it is. The gospel. That not everybody who hears that good news is going to respond to it. Some people are going to hear that good news and they're going to go about their life as usual. Business as usual. I don't care. You know. It, uh, good for you if you want to live that life. But then many of us are going to hear that good news and we're going to respond. And Paul says that's faith. When you respond, you respond by faith. In order to receive the great gift that God has given to the human family. Right? You know, it's kind of like saying, I, I have done this incredible thing for you. I've given you this incredible thing, and, and it's wonderful, and it's beyond your ability. You could not have accomplished this on your own, but I have something I want you to do. I don't know why people are so uncomfortable with that. I think it's because we feel like we're, we're working to earn our grace or earn our salvation. Paul never promotes that idea in the least. But he does promote the idea that God has something that we are supposed to do. God doesn't just universally rescue the entire human family. He probably could, but he didn't. He has made salvation available through Jesus, and he has invited us, those who hear the gospel, to respond to the gospel. And Paul says that's faith. We respond by faith. We respond by hearing the word of God and believing it. And just like the Colossians, we'll talk about this later, but how they responded, they believed by faith and they were baptized into Jesus. They received the gift of the Holy Spirit, that that is God's grace. Man has a responsibility, but not just a responsibility in hearing the gospel for the first time and responding to the gospel by faith. But Paul says, guess what? Those of you who have heard the gospel and responded by faith, you also still have a responsibility to continue in the faith, steadfast, unmovable. There's a responsibility to continue. And then Paul adds to that as well. He says, guess what? I have a responsibility too. I have a responsibility as an apostle, as a minister to the gospel of the mystery of Christ, to spread the good news to as many people as possible so that they may hear and respond by faith. Paul says in verse 25, he says, of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship which God bestowed on me. So Paul says, you know, I, I have a responsibility too for your benefit so that I might benefit or I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. And then he continues on in verse 26. He says, that is the mystery which has been hidden from past ages and generations, but has now been manifest in his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, the Old Testament writers wrote about a time when the whole world, all nations would stream into to God's covenant family, that, that people from all over would come and be part of the great blessing of Israel and, and how there would be one who would be raised up, a Messiah who would come and lead the people and shepherd the people. I mean, so many different things that were spoken of. Now, I don't know, I don't know how the Jewish people understood that. You know, but because it, it seems like there were some things about even that message that weren't fully revealed. And in fact, Peter tells us that, you know, there were there were things that they they didn't understand. They didn't get it. And it wasn't until Jesus came and it wasn't until God fully revealed his plan through the person of Jesus, which Paul says, I'm a steward of that 
message, by the way, and the reality of things became evident. And then Paul can get up to a group of Gentiles and he can preach to them. And he, he's not preaching them, to them and saying, okay, all of y'all need to become um, Israelites. In other words, all of y'all need to become part of the old covenant that God made with, with Israel through Moses. And then you can become part of the new family of God. But the new message or the mystery is that whomever desires to become part of the family of God, no matter your heritage, no matter whether you're Jew, whether you're Gentile, whether you're a slave, whether you're free, it doesn't matter. That any and all who hear the good news gospel of Jesus, they didn't have to become Israelites under the old covenant, but they become new covenant people as they embody the resurrection of Jesus through faith. And that's the mystery. That's the good news, that the Gentiles are part of the covenant family of God, not like a, a stepchild kind of relationship, not to say anything bad about stepchildren, but I'm just saying in general, it's not that kind of relationship, but it's a full-blown son. It is a full-blown heir of the promises that come through Jesus. It is a relationship as if they were born into the covenant, because they were when they were born again into the covenant relationship of God. And Paul says, I'm, I'm a steward of that mystery. You know? And it's interesting that he would say that because he's saying that from the position of a person who was born under the old covenant. And he says, now I'm a steward of the mystery that all of you who have been born again in Jesus are now part of the covenant relationship with God. I'm not greater than you because I'm a Jew. And you're not greater than me because you're a Gentile. We are all equals at the cross and the foot of Jesus. Verse 28. He says, we proclaim him admonishing every man, teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Now, Paul often emphasizes this, but he wants to take the credit away from himself. You know, it's not Paul's gospel. It's not Paul. Yes, he's a laborer of the gospel, but, but it's not Paul's plan of salvation. It is always God's plan of salvation. It's not Paul's might and Paul's power. That's not what brings about the change that comes from being covenant children of God. That's not what gives us the peace and to be reconciled to God, that's not where it comes from. It doesn't come from Paul. Paul is simply a steward. He's a servant. But the power is God's. It is God's power. It is God's message. It is God's wisdom. It is his gospel. And we would do well to remember that. To, to humble ourselves into reality that it's all about God. That it's all about him. That anything that we may have in the present, any relationship that we may have with God is not of our own doing, but it is because of God. His power, His might, His wisdom, His gospel, His Son. Moving into chapter 2, Paul continues on. He says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf, and for those who are at Laodicea, and for all those who I have not personally seen, who have not personally seen my face. Now, Paul is writing these letters from prison. He, he has never apparently met the people in Colossae, um, but uh, he's heard about them. Maybe he's written letters to them. Maybe he knows some of them. But it seems like as we read through Colossians that this congregation was most likely planted by the evangelist Epaphras. And so the, the message that Paul gets from them is just hearsay. And so he's writing this letter. He said, you've never seen me, but I'm writing this to you because I love you and I want to encourage you and I want you to be strengthened and I want you to grow. And that's, that's the general idea. Look at verse 2. Um, I think I messed up my slides here. Oh, no. Continue on. It's right there. He says that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery that is Christ himself in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge there, there is this common bond and now it goes it goes beyond any barrier that we may place upon ourselves you know in their culture it goes beyond any racial barrier in our culture it's the same and, and it goes beyond any any status 
whether rich or poor, whether slave or free, Paul makes that point often. It is a bond that transcends all, all stages of life, all age groups, all status symbols in life. It goes beyond that. And it is an incredible bond that knits us together that's love. Not, not just God's love for us, although that's the incredible motivator that, that gives us the kind of understanding of the love that we have for one another. But it's the bond that knits us all together. But I like the fact that Paul points this out. He's already started off with, okay, over all creation, over all things on heaven and on earth, all that you see, Jesus is preeminent. He is superior above all things. There is nothing in this world that hasn't been touched by and through the person of Jesus. That he was in the beginning. That all things were created through him and for him. That he is the one that holds all things together. That nothing you see, nothing, nothing that you see does not have Jesus involved. But then he continues that in, in narrative and that idea. And he talks about the fact that, you know what? When it comes to knowledge, when it comes to wisdom, when it comes to understanding, the answer is Jesus. There's nowhere else to go. There's no other answer that is needed. If you want to know all the wisdom of God, if you want to understand God, if you want to know true knowledge, the source is Jesus. Not just the words Jesus speaks, but the reality of his existence teaches us so much about God and his wisdom. The gospel teaches us so much about God and his wisdom and his knowledge. And Paul says, you, you don't need to go anywhere else. I'll say that. Well, it's because most likely there are some philosophers and people and teachers out there who are saying, yes, Jesus is great, but you also need this. Or, or yes, yes, you have this relationship with God, but in order to continue, you need this wisdom or this knowledge or this special understanding. And in a world like that, Paul says, no, you don't. You don't need any of that. All you need is Jesus. He's the answer. Don't go anywhere else. Don't look anywhere else. You don't need anything else. Meditate and contemplate him and you'll understand the mystery of God's wisdom. Look what he says in verse 4. He says, I say this so that no one will delude you with, with persuasive arguments. For even though I am absent in the body, nevertheless, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. No, he's not, he's not getting on to them. He's not angry with them, as sometimes he, he gets a little frustrated with some of the brethren. You know, he's, he's not accusing them of anything. He's just telling them, look, don't, don't be easily swayed away by somebody else's teaching. And I like the way he says it. He says, you know, those other teachers, they're persuasive. All right, he doesn't sugarcoat it. Their arguments are good, and they're persuasive, and it sounds good, and it's inviting, and it's easy to get trapped into that world. It's easy to hear people speak, and they, they sound good, they're persuasive, their arguments are good, and you're thinking, this, this person's got it all figured out. I'm, I'm going to follow them. I'm going to listen to them. And Paul uses that term. He says, don't don't be deluded. This is the reason I'm writing this. is so that you won't, won't be deluded, that you won't be tricked, that you won't be drawn away by the persuasive arguments of some of these people who are claiming to be able to bring you into a greater faith and relationship to God through some of their means when the reality, it, it only comes through the person and the knowledge and the wisdom of Jesus. And boy, isn't that a message that's true today. I mean, that's what we need to hear. That's what we need to come to realize. That's what we need to meditate on and believe and have confidence in. In a world that speaks so many different messages from so many different people in so many different contexts. We need to come back to the real reality that all wisdom and understanding and knowledge comes through the person of Jesus. Look at verse 6. He says, therefore... Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, 
right? Not, not just in receiving in baptism, but receiving an understanding and receiving in, in a new way of life, the wisdom, the knowledge, the fullness of assurance, all the things that, that Paul has already said is really summed up in that concept of receiving Christ Jesus the Lord. He says, as you have already received him, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed in overflowing with gratitude. Overflowing with gratitude. In other words, when we, when we come to truly understand what God has accomplished and achieved through the person of Jesus, and we've adopted that as our own reality, and when we come to truly understand who Jesus is, we too ought to be overflowing with gratitude. And what does that mean? Well, that means that we're not going to look somewhere else. We're not seeking out something else. We're not looking for other wisdom. We're not looking for other knowledge. We're not looking for other ways to get to be in a relationship with God. We are simply looking to, to Jesus and we're maintaining our faith, holding steadfast to the faith in Jesus, being built up and established in our faith is a result of having been firmly rooted in him and overflowing with gratitude. If there's anybody here this morning, maybe, maybe you have not truly put your faith in Christ. Maybe you know about the grace of God and you've heard about the gospel of Jesus, but you haven't responded in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins by faith. That opportunity is available for you this morning. Maybe you've been walking that walk for a while and your faith has has wavered, whatever your need might be, if you would come forward as we stand and as we sing.